first uh, lecture of the ACT lecture series. Um, and I'm happy to see everyone here. Uh, the new title for this time is called uh, Experiments in Thinking, Action, and Form. And uh, actually using this space for us is an experiment. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of having the lecture take place in this, this room. And um, one of the things that we plan to do is also have a reception afterwards uh, in the Venus Lab. And uh, you're invited. So, um, uh, yes. So I'd like to thank uh, MIT <laughs> for allowing this to occur, meaning allowing ACT to exist. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Laura uh, for assisting me uh, in uh, the pragmatics of organization. My name is Renee Green, and I'm currently directing ACT program. And I'm very happy to see everyone here tonight. Um, I won't give an extended introduction. I'd like to focus on our guest, Michael Karras, uh, who I'm very happy uh, is with us. Thank you for being with us. Uh, he is a professor and also chair uh, of the Department of Art uh, at Southern Methodist University, SMU, uh, in Dallas. And um, he's also uh, known uh, as a writer uh, and as a participant uh, in the group Art and Language Collaborative. Uh, but uh, he's done quite a few things in his uh, time as, as an artist and a thinker and a writer uh, and also an, as an art historian. Uh, his most recent publication uh, is entitled Art, Word, and Image. Um, it was published in 2010. Uh, it's co-authored by David Lomas and John Dixon Hunt. And he is also in the process of editing a series called um, Art Since 1980 uh, to be published by Reaction Books. And um, I'd like to mention that um, the next uh, lecture that's going to take place in this series uh, will occur in uh, March. And at that time, um, Bruce Yanomoto, uh, who is a filmmaker and an artist, uh, will be joining us at that time. And uh, I'd like to also thank, uh, in terms of um, something that's new uh, and also continued from previous times with ACT, uh, the staff of ACT who's been very supportive in terms of um, getting the new website up. Uh, and uh, so that's the location where you can now find a lot of information about upcoming events. And I'd like to welcome Uta <laughs> Meta Bauer. Uh, she's among us now. They're a, the former uh, director of ACT, but she's graced us with her presence. And so welcome. And uh, without any further ado, uh, Michael. Uh, good evening. It really is a pleasure to be here. This is the most complex presentation I've ever done with two screens. Uh, I'm hoping it'll go very smoothly. I'd like to start off by um, clearing the ground, as it were, um, and uh, then we'll quite quickly get into visuals um, both behind me and some live internet <laughs> stuff. Okay. I'm just going to um, start with, with the abstract, which is on the, the poster. Um, I have to say that this is the beginning of, of a body of work, of, of a project, uh, 
And I'm really happy to have the opportunity to sort of lay it out in, in this outline form now. Um, there'll be lots of gaps, I'm sure, and, and lots of very interesting questions, I hope, um, to sort of pull me in different directions and, and guide some of this thinking further on. Um, but very, it's very rare that you get the opportunity to kind of bring that together in, in a public forum like this. Okay, I begin with the question, what do artists know? Some contemporary art is profoundly engaged with the world in ways that go beyond interpretation. We seem to be in the midst of a cultural moment where the instrumentalization of art has never been more widely accepted among artists. Whether such artistic practices seek to work across disciplines like science or sociology, or aim to intervene positively in the social and cultural life of communities, the artists involved may be said to hold in common the belief that there is a real advantage that flows from the fact that they come to the scene as artists. We are familiar with the notion of the artist as a problem solver, as an individual trained to think in unconventional ways in order to, quote, get the job done, unquote. But what of other more contentious knowledge claims, claims that rival science in the production of new knowledge, for example? And through the course of this lecture, I'm going to try to un unravel, unpack, unpack that idea of knowledge um, through a series of historical and contemporary examples. We're going to look at the artist placement group, um, some early work of art and language, um, and the uh, current work of Francis Whitehead, to name a few. So this is going to form the basis of what I call an inquiry into the belief that art artists constitute a privileged class of problem solvers. When Ad Reinhardt, who you see on the large screen um, to my right, <laughs> Uh, complained that one of the problems with post-war American art was that artists were too eager to allow their art to do a job. He was goading his fellow artists into a more active state of self-management. If art refused to do its job, as defined by the critic, the curator, or the patron, then the artist had a chance to maintain his or her autonomy. The trope that Reinhardt used to signify this state of nobility and control was the academy which he dubbed the New Academy. The historical term academy had been part of Reinhardt's comic arsenal since 1953, when he wrote The Artist in Search of the Academy, Part 1, followed by Part 2 in 1954, 12 Rules for a New Academy in 1957, and in response to a question posed by Thomas Hess, the editor of Art News, is there a new academy? in 1959. The joke is this new academy was really Reinhardt's answer to the sclerotic power relations of the New York art world in the 1950s as he saw it and experienced it. The term academy evokes a dusty, hidebound institution that is selective to the point of elitism, uncritical with respect to the established rules of craft and guild, and suspicious of extreme innovation and change that has thus far beguiled the modern artist and contributed to the luster of a freewheeling life world of the avant-garde. Freedom for Reinhardt was inexorably linked to necessity. If the culture commanded of the artist to sell, liberty could only be found through a refusal to participate in the market. If the tempo of art making was driven by the constant replacement of the old by the new and of the new by the new new, the artist's integrity could only be guaranteed if she resolved to paint, quote, the same painting over and over again, unquote. Now we have discovered that self-determination for art can indeed be found in a context where art works. And this is, this is part of the interesting bit of, of um, what I'm trying to put across tonight. There are artists who are activists and activists who utilize strategies derived from art. I'm interested to talk about artists who work across boundaries and try to hold high the flag of the arts, in plural, 
as practices of knowledge formation, as well as knowledge transfer and engines of effect. Along the way, we encounter critics and historians of art who find this conception of art to be unacceptable. So great is their disdain for works of art that are the willing to reanimate that great zombie philosophy, essentialism, and continue to cling to the narrowest conception of the aesthetic. Other, more capable minds have attempted some of, of the hard problem of outflanking and rethinking the postmodern situation, the consequences of the post-medium situation in postmodernism, as we understand it, by claiming, for example, that a medium may be something other than matter. And that, of course, is a, is a reference to Rosalind Krauss's new book, Under Blue Cup, where she talks about medium as logic, as a way of retaining a certain framework for talking about art that involves the aesthetic and interpretation, but also able to encompass some of the new changes that took place in practices from the 1960s onwards. Against this set of competing ideas about what the arts should or might be good for, for I would like to consider autonomy and de-skilling, the two main strands of my story. Neither concepts are simple, although like so many terms in art, they are not immune to the fate of reduction at the hands of less thoughtful commentators. Here I'd like to add some complexity to these terms in both an historical and philosophical register. I don't claim that in the allotted time this evening I'll be able to do justice to both fields to the degree that is warranted, but this is a beginning and I beg for your indulgence in this initial foray into what is paradoxically both a highly contested ground in art and culture and an effortlessly embraced <clears throat> mode of going on as an artist. And to just underscore that point, we already have advertised academic programs that are quite happy to talk about their relationship to ideas like relational aesthetics and make this a fixed curriculum for learning about art. Um, whether or not that constitute, constitutes another aspect of a new academy, I think is, a, is a quite an open question. But throughout um, this presentation, I'm really interested in the conditions of learning and sharing in art, how artists are educated, what they need to know, how they learn, and how these things manifest themselves in their practices. Having identified the concepts of de-skilling and autonomy, I also want to introduce a third conceptual lever, which is the idea of instrumentalism. Um, this is the part of my talk that's not well developed, but <laughs> it's somewhere that I want to go. Um, why do we begin here? OK, there are two reasons, I think. First, the art we're discussing has already set itself in, to various degrees in opposition to the conventions of object-based art. And secondly, those who reject object-based art as a central and true category of artistic practice hold strongly to the belief that art in the singular needs a job to do if it is to survive in our knowledge-based culture. To contemplate the alternative is simply unthinkable. That is, to commit oneself to a practice that has already been pictured as irrelevant and dead. We read this in a rather startlingly and uncharacteristically rhetorical description of, for example, the PLACE program at the University of New Mexico. I'm going to employ the term instrumentalism in a sense that is derived from the philosopher John Dewey uh, in his own development of the philosophy of pragmatism. And in this sense, instrumentalism means values generally or in some sphere, for example, aesthetics, that are instrumental in promoting satisfaction. I think one profits by reading Dewey's Art as Experience with an Open Mind. It's a text from the 1930s. It's from another, another time. 
but it has some very interesting insights and um, one could develop those quite well because I think one of the central problems here is what to do with aesthetics. Consider, for example, that that book is dedicated to Albert Barnes, the eccentric collector who established the Barnes Foundation in the pleasant Philadelphia suburb of Marion, Pennsylvania. Now, Barnes was a man with a, with a mission, as anybody who's ever had the good fortune to visit that collection would know. And as you go there, you realize that it's quite a different experience from any other museum that you're ever likely to visit. Um, different from, say, MoMA or the Met, despite the fact that all three institutions have a strong commitment to education. When we talk of satisfactions, as, as Dewey has been, that implies agency. So let's consider what it means to embrace the notion that the arts are agents of change. We've not yet specified what kinds of agents of change the arts may be or how they operate on us as subjects. But it seems to me that the notion that the arts are a kind of causal agent goes to the heart of the matter, especially if we redescribe the crisis in art as one of artists casting about for a job to do in an increasingly f crowded field of media effects, digital communication, the spectacularization of architecture, and a highly diverse market of entertainment products from music to cinema to video games. The very name artist is hardly a predicate, though. It's not a predicate in the way that, say, red, crisp, or juicy are when applied to an apple. Yet to assert that a particular set of competencies or expertise in here in the, pres in the person of the artist is questionable especially if the claim is that regardless of the endeavor into which artists are thrown, it is efficacious and wise to bring them to bear on problem solving. When I am confronted with such a claim, I try to distinguish between its weak and strong forms. In its weak form, it is asserting that artists, while schooled for one thing, that is making art, are actually quite good at other things, such as boosting corporate morale, devising ingenious ways to organize work, or figuring out more aesthetically pleasing forms of community gardens. In its strong form, the claim asserts that artistic practice is a form of knowledge creation unto itself. Dewey writes, the philosopher Ian Hacking, despised the, specta the spectator theory of knowledge. Dewey argues that, quote, things we make, including all tools, including language as a tool, are instruments that intervene when we turn our experiences into thoughts and deeds that serve our purposes, unquote. In Art as Experience, Dewey tells us that, quote, a social relation is an affair of affectations and obligations, of intercourse, of generation, influence, and mutual modification. It is in this sense that relation is to be understood when used to define form in art, unquote. Dewey's definition of art seems straightforward enough, mutual adaptation of parts to one another and constituting a whole, something like a system. The difference between a machine and a work of art, however, is this. In one case, a particular and limited end is fulfilled. In the other case, the work of aesthetic art satisfied many ends, none of which is laid down in advance. Now, when that particular aim is or potential is qualified, I think that's mostly the place where critics start to bristle and where artists start to wonder exactly what sort of effect am I having. But this potential we'll see when we're talking about some of these historical um, examples I want to raise um, has been worked into, internalized into some of the structures that place artists outside their normal habitat. Okay. When Dewey cites Santayana being, quote, carried by contemplation of nature to a vivid faith in the ideal, unquote, he means the statement to apply to art as to nature. And it indicates an instrumental function exercised by a work of art. Dewey tells us that we are carried to a refreshed attitude 
towards the circumstances and exigencies of ordinary experience. The work, in the sense of working, of an object of art does not cease when the direct act of perception stops. Persons repulsed by the idea of art's purpose nevertheless glorify art for some state of mind induced by it. Dewey was pilloried for suggesting that everything serve a purpose when he actually was pointing out that no human activity can take place without reference to the context in which it is embedded. The issue of de-skilling asks us to reconsider the nature and extent to which the work of art is embodied through matter and the kind of experience that is possible from our encounter. But it also raises the question, how do artists learn? What do artists need to know? Okay. Good to go. Okay. <laughs> so the artist placement group, art and language in New York in the early 70s, <clears throat> a particular critical reflection by Ian Byrne on conceptualism as a whole, conceptual art as a whole, and um, some relatively recent work by the Chicago artist Francis Whitehead. The artist placement group starts out in 1966, um, consisting of John Latham and Barbara Stavini and a number of their friends listed here including Jeffrey Shaw and uh, Ian McDonald Monroe and Barry Flanagan amongst, um, and Stuart Brisley, I guess, is amongst the more widely known artists who have established careers beyond that. Some of the basic tenets of the artist placement group, and um, if you're like me, you hate it when text is thrown up on the screen and the lecturer just repeats what you're seeing, you all can read. Um, <laughs> but I just want to point out a few things about some of these um, points, points of view. How they attempt to move the artist and what the artist does outside of the studio-based condition. We talk a lot about context and frameworks. That's really part and parcel of our legacy of the 1960s forward. And I'll just, I'll just say in passing, um, I too am and a bit fed up by having to see everything behind the veil of the 1960s. Um, but I think it's still important to look historically at some of these things because it's not always clear that we catch the richness, the vividness of what has gone before us um, to the extent that, say, a, a critic and writer like Nicholas Borio could claim that it is really not in the best interest of contemporary artists to look back to the 60s and 70s um, because the differences that he's already established between then and now are fixed, irrevocable. Um, I'd like to think that we could have some more fluid reinterpretations and that if the study of the past is of any use at all, that it will suggest some other ways to go forward rather than dispute the past as some sort of scholastic exercise. One of the most interesting concepts that John Latham came up with is the idea of the artist as an incidental person. And it's quite a punning um, name, incidental in many senses. Um, the rest of the manifesto is a recasting, for example, of some of the ideas that John Ruskin brought forward in the 19th century. And then it also comes from the experience of the new young sculptors of the early and mid-1960s in London who were experimenting with materials. These are sculptors that broke out of the mold of Henry Moore and were experiencing the work of Anthony Carroll, but were also going a little bit further into um, exploring what new materials could mean for the nature of sculpture. And finally, I think something that has been largely overlooked in the 
the critical writing about the artist placement group is their introduction of the notion of research. And as far as the culture of art and education in Britain is concerned, research is now a central pillar. Um, one of the few countries that has a well-developed PhD, practice-led PhD program across the university sector, um, something that is toyed with by some institutions in the United States, but is not really uh, adapted, adopted very widely. Um, the idea of research as something that one does as an artist has a lot of different meanings attached to it, granted. Um, it could mean uh, simply getting involved in bibliographic research, um, using the studio in a relatively conventional experimental way, but perhaps a more rigorous framework attached to that, more systematic framework. But it does echo the idea of research in the terms of research and development and also the model that science provides us, the Baconian model of empiricism uh, brought down um, through the 17th century to form the central tenet of our understanding of science, though that, of course, is a very contested understanding. If you read anything in the philosophy of science from Thomas Kuhn through Emer Lakatosh, Feyerbund, Peter Gallison, and so on onward. Three basic propositions put forward by the artist placement group in their statement of purpose. They formed a corporation. Uh, amongst the directors were Sir Roland Penrose and Sir William Coldstream. And um, these were the concerns that they, they talked about. The first interest is, well, an artist can be part of an industrial or corporate concern as a salaried staff member. Secondly, they would be free to do whatever they wanted there, or they could engage with the activities of the enterprise. And that's shown here. If required, they'll make themselves available. Okay. So in fact, um, the artist placement group had a very open idea of what the artist was supposed to do in, in this setting. <clears throat> Many of the artists involved in the artist placement group did work with companies like um, British Petroleum, Esso, uh, the National Coal Board. Um, some of them worked at uh, Brunel College in the, the um, institutes involved in psychological research, industrial psychology. Um, <clears throat> one artist was involved um, on a, a tanker um, and uh, was, was sort of hired there to be an artist in residence aboard a ship <laughs> and, uh, in fact, was making sculptures on his own. And these were being thrown overboard by the captain, who was really pissed off because he said, we wanted you here to teach the sailors watercolors so they could relax. And instead, you're making these ridiculous sculptures, so forget that. And, um, <laughs> and of course, John Latham and uh, later Barbara Stavini um, also were very interested in actually integrating this project with some of the uh, ministries of the state. So we have here an art state complex that is, that is considered. Um, so that artists would work with some of the governmental agencies. And um, that was a very different kind of picture from, from what you might have imagined artists would do business. But this whole, this complex, whether it's art in the state or art in industry, um, is, is coming to the fore in, in the mid-60s. John Latham, as, as an individual, um, He's a very interesting artist in his own right. And as he recounts, the idea of the artist placement group and why an artist without any particular brief 
without a specific steer should logically find themselves in industry or government is kind of based on this, this notion that he had, a very strange notion coming out of his understanding of quantum physics. He called it the least event. So between the incidental person and the least event, he developed this very elaborate and quite obscure framework to justify how it was that artistic activity embodied certain kind of knowledge and that the artist itself would be this sort of container of potential within um, an enterprise. His most, I, I guess, controversial work occurred in 1966 when he checked out a copy of Clement Greenberg's Art and Culture from the St. Martin's Art School Library, um, distributed amongst friends at his house to chew and then expectorate into a flask. The resultant material was fermented and then repackaged in a very interesting uh, array of objects and texts called Art and Culture in 1966. Um, he was fired because he stole property of St. Martin's Library, didn't return his books on time and um, lost his job, 1967. Still, um, this art and culture, or still and chew, as it's sometimes referred to, um, I think really was his exit from conventional art teaching and into this idea of the incidental person and the artist placement group. Uh, Lucy Lepard was a great fan of um, of his work, and here in a letter to the art dealer Nicholas Logsdale um, from 1970, which is the time uh, that she was preparing her um, well-known book, uh, The Dematerialization of Art, 1966 to 1972, um, makes a few good jokes about <laughs> the relationship between John Latham's art and culture and uh, Clement Greenberg's theory of, of modernism and just the general situation of artists at the time. Okay. You can go now to um, a project in the early 70s, Blurting in Art and Language, uh, done in New York. And that particular project has been recast in an online form. This was its original form which is a, a small pamphlet, A5 size, uh, half of an eight and a half by 11. And um, I'll explain briefly what was going on there by actually referring to blurting in art and language online because it's a little bit easier. This is a website um, that was constructed, um, really the motivation came from Thomas Dreyer, a very interesting uh, German art historian who has worked on conceptual art um, for at least 15, 20 years um, before he engaged with this project. It consists of the original introduction to the 1973 version uh, where we begin frankly, by talking about librarianship. Because, in fact, that the handbook that we've, we've constructed is, is both an archive and a guide. And the material that forms the content of the handbook was generated over a period of months um, in a very simple way. Um, the eight of us would write um, what we call a blurt, a short text, really generally no longer than one typewritten page, so 350, 400 words. Um, we would circulate this text, and we would start, we started just where we thought we needed to start each of us in terms of looking at the context of what it meant to be a conceptual artist in New York at that time. Um, it was a project of learning where we were going to be teaching ourselves. It was a project bringing in um, critical reflections on 
the material that we were reading, which was not standard to, to art or art history, but going widely across linguistics, philosophy, philosophy of science, systems theory, sociology, politics, and so on. We were, in fact, in the search for new resources of expression, teaching us what we needed to know and using these particular elements as tools. Um, often, you'd hear in early critiques of conceptual art, particularly after Joseph Kasuth had published his Art After Philosophy, that conceptual artists were really second and third-rate philosophers, that um, the misinterpretation, the misimpression was that the written texts that we were producing, rather than being an essayistic form of art practice, were thought to be something like philosophy, that we were working as, say, normal philosophers. We weren't. Um, everything was about the conditions and the particular context under which we were getting this material and, and using it. So week on week for, for um, several months, we would be circulating these texts that we wrote. And fairly quickly, we would be starting to respond to each other's text and bring in material to help us shape our arguments and, and have convincing arguments about the positions that we were taking. So it was a collaborative process, and it was very much about reforming, reconfiguring the conditions of learning and sharing as an artist. Once that material was collected, um, it was I indexed it, and then, uh, with the help of Mel, Mel Ramsden, we then went about to organize it in a form that would be useful for retrieval. The indexing process really took very small fragments of the original texts and organized them according to a hundred terms, which you see on the left. Each of these terms had more than one item attached to it. And the entire blurting in art and language has a little bit over 400 entries. So there are some interesting ones. OK, well, that's a little bit too. Let's do this. <laughs> so on the left, we have what we call a blurt. It's numbered, and then it has its index name. And then we have the actual text that we picked out. And then under, underneath it, there are two kinds of operators. The arrowhead, which is sort of like entailment or implication or causality. And then the ampersand, which is like some sort of ability to grab things and get them together to, to sort of collect terms, similar terms. In a, in a kind of a language basket. So you, you can follow from the first entry by just clicking on the number that corresponds to the entry of the index terms that are listed here. So if we go, say, to lexicographer, that'll come up on the right-hand <laughs> side. And it also then reveals its own set of possibilities where you can go. What you're doing here is actually creating a pathway of fragments through this indexed material. And our understanding, um, our intention was that by doing that actively, the reader starts to collaborate in creating some sort of network of meaning. And uh, that has some kind of relevance to themselves. They, can, they do this in, in a kind of a, an experimental way. You can also just scan through by going just numerically in order through the um, particular blurts that, it's the, that you see the numbers at the bottom of these particular entries. So this, this system then comes out of 
a collaborative situation and is a way of trying to provide a guide for someone who is not yet part of the group but would be interested in the group. So there's still that, that bit of distance in terms of, of this particular project. So behind me, I've just reiterated those so we can go through these images a bit quicker. Okay. Good. Okay. Ian Byrne. <clears throat> Ian Byrne participated in this project. He was um, one of the people who worked a um, collaborator in art and language in New York uh, prior to formation of art and language in New York. He was a collaborator with Roger Cutler and Mel Ramsden. And um, they established an organization called the Society for Theoretical Analysis of Art. And I'll get into that a little bit later on. In 1981, Ian Byrne was back in Australia. He was Australian by birth, um, had spent some years in London, in in the mid to late 60s, and then with Mel Ramsden, who was also living in Australia when, when the two of them met, traveled to New York um, and shared a loft and uh, started working together along with the uh, British artist Roger Cutforth, who they had also met in London. So in 1981, um, basically four years after he had left New York for good, he started to reflect on what conceptual art meant, what the consequences of conceptual art were, um, the intended consequences, the unintended consequences, and wrote a very interesting text, The 1960s Crisis and Aftermath. And the main points of the text focus for the first time on this notion of de-skilling. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is really the first engagement with that idea as a problem for, for artists in what we would just call offhand as postmodernism, postmodern art. And the de-skilling as Ian understood it really was a consequence of no longer being in a position where object-oriented art, certain kind of craft situation, was considered to be the norm. What's interesting is that throughout his critique, at this point, he doesn't really focus at all on the other kinds of competencies that one collects in that circumstance. And that's, that's a rather interesting lacuna in his thinking. Um, and this is, this is one that, that I've only recently noticed, because it's only now that I'm interested in going back to this and, and looking for the issue of de-skilling and what he has to say about it, rather than earlier when this, this particular article was important for, for my thinking because of the way it introduced this notion of artists moving further and further away from a kind of a center of art, studio-based practice, and the conventions of art, the institutions of art, into a social setting. And where does that leave them? And we talked really early on, at the same, at the same time we were doing the Blurting in Art and Language and the Annotations Project, we talked about the artist as being the artist out of work, meaning the competencies that were expected, and here we're talking about modernist competencies, no longer held. They no longer applied to what we were doing. So Ian is focusing on that because he's looking in, in this article to try to set the foundations for justification for what really would become his practice over the next decade, which was working in conjunction with the trades unions in Australia as 
part of the cultural arm, uh, as part of a push to introduce culture into the daily life of the Australian working class movement. Um, and by that I meant talking about, criticizing, and reflecting on some very particular issues to Australian cultural life particularly their sense that they were living in an art culture, native art culture of provincialism. Um, they were constantly the target of incursions from New York and modernism through traveling exhibitions, actually, um, organized by the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the fact that they didn't value their own cultural heritage, the fact that they lived in a divided society Aboriginal peoples and the white Western settlers to, to Australia um, had a very conflicted history, and so on. These were the issues that Ian Byrne would take up in his work. Uh, but before he was able to do this, he really wanted to kind of settle some scores with conceptual art. The conclusion of his article was really that conceptual art, yeah, had a lot of good things to offer. Um, much was not delivered, but let's think about it not as a style, but as a transitional activity. In other words, on a bridge to something else. And by building this bridge, um, as I mentioned, looking forward, he really didn't bring a lot of the baggage of the 60s and 70s with him, and with that, the depth of his analysis and the question of de-skilling and autonomy was not as deep and rich as it could have been. So in all of these topics that are listed here, um, we can point to particular examples in art that relate to his period of emergence in the art world, in other words, in the 1960s. And this gives us a nice picture of the concerns of artists then, what was weighing on them, what they thought the determinations were for their art. Now, a potted history of modernism from the 1960s to the 1970s is something you get all the time. And I don't want to repeat that, but go back to the article and then do a little bit more research. Go back to some of the uh, texts that Ian wrote for The Fox or for Red Herring, or um, in this book of his own writings called Dialogues. You can see how he's trying to weave this, what he's learned in the course of his, I suppose he would consider his apprenticeship as a conceptual artist from the 60s to 1977, what he's learned about his relationship to his own culture because it took quite an interesting um, bit of thinking to value the fact that he himself realized that he had negated a big part of his cultural heritage. And since we were talking a lot in New York at the time about indexing, about where we were, and the particular context and framework of our practice, this to Ian began to seem to be a very strange situation indeed a kind of a real schizophrenia, a division within himself, which he tried to cure as he returned to Australia and started thinking about it. And this is the beginning of that process. So we have Donald Judd, of course, who was an important figure and, and relates to um, one of the arguments of de-skilling, which is artists no longer have to make their own work. They can farm it out. They get craftspeople who are much better at doing these things than they are. So there's no need to learn that, which is to say there's no need to consider that the transformatory um, kind of experience of working matter is going to be a central part of what an artist does. And to this day, this aggravates people. Robert Barry, okay, the decreased importance of the physical object, the whole strange notion of dematerialization the myth of dematerialization, exemplified by Robert Barry and other artists of the time. But what we have is, of course, the linguistic token. We have the language, 
subject matter and recognizable imagery. Well, Kenneth Nolan, uh, again, another one of these figures in the modernist painting, the idea of flatness, the idea of getting the work in one go. Interestingly, you have a Kenneth Nolan wall work right here in the, in the lobby, which is kind of strange, strange, because one wouldn't have thought his work would be like that because it's, it's a very dispersed experience. You're, it's something you can't take in in one go. It's not at all like the kind of paintings that, that he did. Um, you don't get it, you have to find it. It's a different sort of, um, it's a different qualitative and a different kind of attention that's required. The date paintings of Ankuara, in a funny way, speaks to the negation of the artist as subject. So the whole idea of self-expression goes out the window. Commercialization of art, uh, exemplified by the rise of the art market in New York in the 60s and the beginning of the internationalization of the art market, which of course was spearheaded in the 60s by conceptual artists themselves uh, for a variety of reasons, the portability of the work, uh, the, and also um, the idea that an artist would go to a site and create a work specific to the site so you didn't have to ship anything but the artist, and an air ticket was a lot cheaper than an air ticket plus a crate or two. And, and this became the way of working, and um, it has consequences. Sexual and racial discrimination in art. Christine Kozlov, conceptual artist, woman, Adrian Piper, conceptual artist, African-American woman. Few and far between, but other kinds of cultural production completely eliminated from view. Social disengagement of the artist. So we show, we, we show this by the, by the negative point. You know, I've proved the point by the negative point. So you see the kinds of areas in which artists who wanted to engage were pushed into or adopted, claimed as their territory. And this is where I think Ian really starts coming into his own and starts looking at Australian art. Um, the Americanization of art is now placed in opposition to an idea that there could be national cultures as relevant, as strong, as, as modernism, as it comes from it. Albert Namajira, an aboriginal artist who was trained in um, Western watercolor techniques, was born and raised in a station way in central Australia. This is a work of his, Mount Sonder, which is one of, the, I believe it's called the McDonald Range, which a mountain range in an area that has a particular significance to the Aboriginal people. Um, we're all familiar with the dreamscape and the paintings derived from sand paintings and, and working with dots, which in the 80s found their way with acrylic and canvas into the galleries of the world and became very, very valuable commodities. Um, both those and Albert's paintings refer to the same idea of the land, that the land, of course, is not something to be owned, which is completely in opposition to the white settler's notion of this. Um, the outback was not um, this, this place of emptiness, but it was 
filled with spirit and life and significance. And even though Namajira was painting these rather conventional watercolors by, by some standards, the subject matter was not just the exoticism of the Australian landscape. That was a very important point. He got ridiculed about this um, from his own people and from white Australians. He died sadly, an alcoholic, uh, I believe in 1959. But he was celebrated as an Aboriginal artist, and in 1947, the film Namajira the Painter was made. It was a documentary of his work. And here we see him working on site, en plein air. In Ian Burns' work of the late 1980s, and uh, this follows a format that he continues into the 1990s, he, he died in 1993, tragically. Um, Ian Byrne is taking a version of an Albert Namajira painting, The Gap at Heaver Tree, and superimposing this text that starts to reflect on the significance of landscape, the significance of representation of landscape, and also referring back to some of his earliest conceptual artwork, which was a dissection of opticality, of vision. Later, um, during the 80s, um, he would curate exhibitions called On Looking and Seeing, where he would collect works that had this very interesting tension between the perception and the figure that was represented and that the whole idea of the work was about the ambiguity of that relationship. Okay. Then a later work of his called Value Added Landscape, where the background image is actually an amateur painting that he sourced from uh, just one of these you know, junk shops, picked it up, and then again superimposed it with a text that reflects on the complexity of seeing, looking, and representation. These are complex works in terms of their structure, uh, their, their overlay, uh, these layers, and the idea is that obviously you can't see the landscape clearly without reading the text, but to see the landscape is not to be able to read the text and vice versa. So it goes a little bit back to the Wittgensteinian rabbit duck discussion and philosophical investigations, but pulls it into his own cultural context, because here is a naive painter, an amateur painter, painting the Australian landscape in a way that becomes the genre, the, the way that Painting the Australian landscape has this cultural importance for both the Aboriginal and Australian white settlers. And then overlaid with this text that seems to refer to the psychology of vision and opticality, but is really a very culturally embedded text. This idea of, of kind of instability of, of the object of art was really raised um, going back to his very first encounter with conceptual art as a conceptual artist with Ian Byrne and um, Roger Cutforth, but by this time Roger Cutforth had left the group. 1969, all of their work was what we call essayistic, and it was published as proceedings, sometimes as small pamphlets, other times as these poster-like works that you see. And this is, so this is the Society for Theoretical Art. And in, in reading this particular text, you can see the concerns. I mean, the first order of business was, there is no essential art object. We don't know the qualities that adhere to the object. And let's talk about frameworks and context. So this is how that becomes an important lever to get the artist literally out of the studio, out of the studio practice out of the old area of skills and conventions. Okay, we can leap forward now to nearly where we are today, 
So Francis Whitehead teaches at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, she originally trains as a sculpture, a sculptor, and during the course of the renovation of a new home of her and her husband, um, with the intention of making it as green as possible, she discovers that this is a much more interesting endeavor than making sculpture. And it engages her with other kinds of domains of knowledge, um, energy, alternative energy sources, um, plant biology, materials science, the whole eco-structure. And, and from this, she starts to develop the idea of practice. And uh, through a, a variety of named sites that she's working on, the um, Art et al., Art and Others, um, has a number of things. And we'll just pull up a couple very quickly. The Embedded Artist, let me get this one a little bit. where she asks quite directly, what does the artist know? And let's see, that goes on. Nope, we don't want that. Hang on, let me go back, see if I could find something here. Large lab, OK. Here's her engagement with the School of the Art Institute, the Knowledge Lab. Um, there's also, oops, get rid of that. Ah, uh, this is the thing that everybody dreads. Okay. And I was hoping that there would be another one. Uh, let's see what artists know. There we are. Oh, artists know a lot. And this, <laughs> I know, let me just... <laughs> I don't mean that sarcastically. But, OK, um, recall Artist Placement Group and their modest three-point program. You know, artists should work, get a salary, live industry. Um, the artist can do their own work without any particular purpose attached to it, or if the host invites them, they can participate in a project. So from that, 1966, we get, um, 40 years later, a sense that the competencies and skill set attached to art and artists in the post-medium period is well-established, well-known, and stable. And it's that stability that, that is important to keep in mind. So you have a lot of things here. If you go through this, you wonder, does this only apply to artists? Or does it apply to anybody given a specific circumstance? So I think one of the things that my research is going to push me into is to think a lot harder about how the claims, the knowledge claims, or what sense of epistemology is being projected here. There's knowledge and there's know-how. And, and of course, that's why I brought up instrumentalism, because there you have a direct link to satisfaction of goals. And, and in Dewey's mind, aesthetics and the satisfaction of a goal go hand in hand. In Claire Bishop's mind, it's a problem. In Grant Kester's mind, there's a more expansive idea of art and aesthetics. Or, to understand it in another way, there's a continuum in which those particular terms exist, coexist, interrelate. But here, in making the list, we have a kind of a stability that is advertising the artist as someone who can solve problems in a very particular way, and is making a claim for the special status of the artist in so doing. And that, that I think, is, is interesting. 
now, I think behind me, what have we got? Okay, we got the emblem, we'll move on from that. A more interesting project <clears throat> by Frances is the slow cleanup, where she's investigating what's called phytoremediation. And there, she's interested in taking waste sites in Chicago, abandoned gasoline stations in particular, and developing patterned plantings to very slowly decontaminate the soil of the site. And this means she's working with plant scientists, with botanists, but also doing this in the context of another art and state complex. And that she calls the Embedded Artist Project, where she is working in the city of Chicago as an artist embedded in the city doing this particular project. Here's planting of trees as part of that particular endeavor. And finally, I think this is where you can learn a bit more about the remediation idea. Um, there's quite a lot of information on this particular website, which is called Make Art with Purpose. This is a portal for these particular projects. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with it. Um, if not, that's wonderful. If you are, then you're going to ask me some hard questions, I hope. So let me wrap this up. Good. OK. Another interesting text, but one that was written only a, a few years ago, Emergency Conditionals. And this is by Michael Baldwin, Charles Harrison, and Mel Ramsden. Um, who at the time were the current members of Art and Language. Uh, Charles Harrison since died, uh, and now there's just Michael Baldwin and Mel Ramsden under that name. Emergency Conditionals is really about the problem of de-skilling becoming a new academy. And um, one thing one particular work that I did, uh, really motivated by the occasion of Charles' death, created a series of, of typographic sample sheets and put them into a pamphlet, the kind that you might get from a, a type foundry. And um, I took excerpts from obituaries of Charles and also some of the writings uh, An emergency conditional is one of them. And the idea about the way, the instability of the name of the artist, the instability of the role of the artist, the job of the artist, was one way to avoid this reification um, that we see as a kind of a new academy of post-medium art. So if you're being called one thing, then you switch and you do something else, and you just always try to create this instability. A good reason for doing this is because from the very beginning, the use of language and the circumstance or situation of conversation was already being reified as an art object. We have, for example, the work of Ian Wilson, who at the same time during the late 60s, early 70s, was gathering people together in galleries and posing a question. And then they would sit there and discuss this. And many of the questions that he posed were taken from the dialogues of Plato. So they were very interesting kind of tautological devices uh, about what we know. Because then basically these ideas of, 
epistemology. How do we know? What do we know? And all. And this was, this was presented as a work of art, but it had this, this quality of just a gathering. Our conception in art and language was that we weren't necessarily making works of art, and essayistic works of art, at least, did not have the same status or could not be looked at in the same way as other kinds of object-oriented works of art. This is already very old. I mean, we're talking about ideas that bear the same chronological relationship to us today as even pre-Cubism for to Jackson Pollock in 1947. Now, it goes without saying that Pollock and the artists of the New York School were obsessed with killing Picasso, Picasso of 1913, the Picasso and Brock of Cubism. And um, I'm happy to be sacrificed on the altar of contemporary art because I don't consider that I'm there as a conceptual artist. But the wealth of the experience and the historical record is an interesting way to move forward, kind of a hesitating way. And for me, this is really a starting point. And again, constantly returning to that, where if you look at the contingency of some of these practices that we've seen briefly today, um, we're talking about over and over again, the thing that comes through in all of them is the desire to reshape the conditions under which artists learn and share and develop their work. And that these are the conditions that always need to be examined. And at certain times, it is the examination of the conditions that is far more important than what you can generate from those conditions only and insofar as you want to avoid the risk of becoming a new academy in art. So culture as learning and sharing, a very simple definition of culture, but one I think that provides a kind of a touchstone for constant critical revision of what you're doing as an artist in the world. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> Sorry if that went a little over, but you were fine. Okay, um, great. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for that uh, very probing and provocative presentation. Uh, and now, uh, would you like to? Um, Take some questions. Oh yes. Okay. Of course. Thanks. I'll help moderate. <laughs> Anyone have a question right off the bat? Um, so I, I like the way you um, ended the presentation um, about kind of underlining this point about like the conditions under which artists work and learn. Um, I, I also um, thought of this question when you were showing the kind of program in relational aesthetics, the website for that. Um, and just between what you said at the end and between that, I'm curious what you think about like how, um, how to like practice this ep epistemology in the existing university or institutional structures, or if that's even possible, or to what extent it may be, um, or what needs to change to, to make it so? It is, it is possible. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to show was one way that I'm trying to realize it where I'm at at Southern Methodist University, and that is I've turned my office into the Free Museum of Dallas. So to create <laughs> another space of learning within the context of the normal or conventional space of learning. I think um, if what you're asking is, um, are universities or 
is the situation that you're in free enough to allow for that kind of dynamism? I think it, it can be, it can be made free. Um, some places are better than others at negotiating that. Um, Perhaps the, the biggest stumbling block is the notion of the curriculum. But every, every college professor, every university professor who's had any degree of experience knows how to shape that to satisfy whatever administrative necessities there are. Because this is, you know, this is something that we, we have managers above us, believe it or not, um, who have another kind of idea of what constitutes adequacy in learning. Um, is, is that sort of getting at what you were interested in? Um, yeah, um, it, it is. I, I mean, I, it's also, I think, um, when you're talking about like the um, relationship between art and activism, um, perhaps like in the university, it kind of takes this connotation or would attach itself to like um, the history of student activism where students begin to understand themselves in alliance with, um, with faculty or, or non-administrators um, for a certain um, like truth or epistemology as opposed to the interests of administrators which may, may be that but at, at the same time often is not sadly. Um, so, I don't know, what's the, um, I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm really intrigued by the, what you say that you can create like a, a sub space within the space and yeah. um, is that, but would you say that's the, the end or is no. it, is there no. a mm -hmm. further? Like, I, I, I don't know, the, I mean, there is, there's a big movement, um, certainly in the UK, of independent art schools that are non-degree granting institutions that are just about people wanting to come together and structure their learning as, as, as they wish um, without those particular pressures. Um, I think at a place like MIT, there should be a lot of scope for self-management of learning within the envelope of, of a course, um, how much further you want to go in, in kind of looking at the whole structure relationship and say your relationship inside and outside the university is something you have to determine for yourself. I don't think there's a, a particular uh, formula for that. Um, it's been said, for example, of the ideas put forward in relational aesthetics that they're far too accommodating, that they're looking for ways of you know, subverting and undermining situations from inside. Um, but I think that's only, only because people, uh, the artists involved, don't understand how to, how to deal with the question of aesthetics and agency in any other way but create an oppositional pair, even though they'll, they'll bitterly contest that. So, what is necessary really depends on what kind of needs you've decided for, for yourself. What, what aspects of your education do you think need to be looked at and, and restructured? Um, that's, that's a very, it's about contingency. It's not about looking at a model of the past and sort of saying, yeah, you're not political because you're not burning down the registrar's office. Um, yeah, that's ridiculous, but, but that's the caricature that, that one has to kind of live with. Um, plus, I mean, I didn't even get into the role of technology in all of this and the possibilities and potential for that, and uh, it's a whole different situation. You don't need bricks and mortar. Um, I, I was... Looking at this from a management point of view, I mean, at some point you want artists to be integrated with an industry in some form or fashion. But I feel that there, how would that process begin effectively and wouldn't there need to be some way of having a management course that included a requirement of artistry or fine arts or 
this sort of thing so that it could be a top-down dictate. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the ecosystem or the support system for that. I'm just mm. curious what your comments are about. Well, I mean, you could argue that already artists have been involved with industry for a long time as designers in, in advertising, promotion, marketing, and so on. Um, another friend of mine, Maureen Connor, is an artist who's also interested in this idea of what you can do in other fields. She's focused her work on institu in institutions, but lately she's been in interested in learning about and engaging with critical management theory. There is something called critical management theory. I'm not all that familiar with it, but um, it's about how you shape social clusters within institutions, organizations. Um, there can be a lot of interesting things to add to the education of an artist. Um, and I think the whole point is that if you do want to work with industry, maybe industry has to take the position that John Latham and Barbara Stavini had hoped they might take, which is, let's just see what happens. And that doesn't mean that it's, it's necessarily the artist alone can do that, but it's the attitude of openness. And I suppose that contemporary management theory um, is very much concerned with motivating people in institutional settings and with giving them this sense of autonomy. Um, but the flip side of that is um, you're asked to do anything at any time, <laughs> any moment, and you're still within, within that frame. So um, artists have also um, looked at that, actually. Um, Jan Vervoort, the curator, um, curated the Sheffield Biennial 2005, and it was titled Yes, No, Maybe. And he talks about just-in-time production and also about the way in which current ethos of globalization in a knowledge economy asks of people to be able to retrain reskill themselves, do all sorts of things as and when the economic cycle demands of it. So the whole idea of an avocation, a profession, something that's solid, is completely gone in terms of the, the atmosphere, the climate of, of, of the economy on a global scale. And so you have artists who are looking at that and saying, wait a minute, there might be, you know, this is something that we w might want to look, look at. And oddly enough, you start coming back to Ad Reinhardt's strange position. You sort of wonder, is there a possibility of disaffirmation? And when does dis disaffirmation become the order of the day? So the, the thing that I like about Artist Placement Group is that it was a very positive affirmation. Yes, we're artists. We're building the world, too. And this happens in Britain when Harold Wilson was talking about the white heat of technology the moment when Britain was really coming out of the post-war economic depression that it had suffered. And so everything seemed to be quite possible. Um, now, OK, that's possible to do that because it's pretty conventional. Artists are doing it in various ways all over the time, all over the place. And corporations also are embracing art in various forms. So you wonder, you know, how could we maybe maintain, retain our autonomy. For me, autonomy is about self-management in artists. And, and so uh, an artist who writes, curates, and so forth is really taking work away from the mediators, the critic, the curator, and this. And this could be a good thing. This could be a good thing. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's no straight answer to your question, but I'd, I'd say that um, if an artist is interested, they could think about how they might engage with it in that kind of critical sense, falling in and out at will. Again, not turning it into a, a sort of a job, as it were, well-defined job description. That kind of instability is not what makes careers in the art world, generally speaking. Well, actually, if I could just ask a follow-up to that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious how, even if you don't actually work for one of these companies or you aren't, you aren't uh, engaged as a consultant with one of these companies, mm -hmm. um, that 
with management, contemporary management theory developing these terms of openness, of uh, sort of like uh, active adaptability, um, mm -hmm. and being able to cope with innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, as those terms and that thinking are developed so strongly, if it would even be possible to self-destabilize mm -hmm. now, even if you wanted to, even the way that you would frame that, I think, may get caught up in the adaptability. Yeah. It's, an, it's an excellent question, because um, one wonders, what would such a practice look like? Would it mean a return to the watercolors of Albert Namajira? Uh, and, and this issue has been raised, I mean, quite seriously, um, as a way of you know, finding you know, what does disaffirmation mean in this context? And there are altogether too many people who are um, eager to embrace that in the sense of, yeah, go back to life drawing, go back to sculpting, go back to teaching people how to do things in the studio because that's what art is about. And you know, forget about these new fads. I mean, the new fad that's been going on for 50 years, hardly a fad, it's a, it's a cultural given. It's an idée fixe. Um, I have no idea. Um, and I think if, if, I had, if I'm spending more time thinking about being an artist and less time thinking about how my writing and my free museum and everything else kind of deflects and evades that question, then, then I, might, I might have something to say in, in some time. But I do know people who are considering, considering it seriously. And thus far, um, they haven't been able to do, make any kind of work that seems to respond to all of those issues that you're raising. Thus far, they seem to be focused on how art has become a very strange thing in culture, how it's, it's used. And again, they're saying, well, that's a kind of instrumental, instrumentalism that we're not interested in. And so where is the resistance? And they're coming some sort of neo adornesque position of refusal. So you've got that's there's that, and then there's let's let's have a good look at John Ruskin and go back to that. Yeah, um, <coughs> seems like from the perspective of uh, now, 2012, the discussion of art and language issues. I think. I think brings a, a distance. Um, I think uh, that already when it appears in the 60s and 70s, the discussion arrives to a certain kind of exhausted dead end from a kind of tautological inside issues of near families a group of people discussing issues in a way that it was not affecting much of the rest of the production or the outside world. But that to see even now, 40 years later, I think the debate, I think, is pretty much exhausted. And I couldn't see any kind of open door on that situation. Conceptually, in many, many different forms. In certain way, we could call post-conceptualism that it was trying to look for other venues, on other paths, on other situation. It could be paradoxical, it could be contradictory, but the linguistic aspect of the art and language, I think it arrives to a certain tautological situation than, for example, this uh, culture, equal learning and sharing, I think everybody will agree on that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think if people agree with this behind that in terms of the construction of language made by the art and language and certain kind of linguistic movements of the period. Mm. But that <coughs> my feeling is to see from the perspective something that in their time it was already 
exhausted this gas. And we could see with other family of, I mean, you say relational art, I think it's, it could be the same story now from that perspective. And that I think what's important is maybe to see some open doors, some situation which kind of indicated ideas or motivated, especially in the context of a situation like here, I'm saying, mm -hmm. where we have the obligation to really try to figure out what we do with all these issues. Mm. It's a comment, but also maybe you could mm. come up with something from that. Yeah, yeah, I remember, um, well, my, my friend and your friend Alfredo Jor once said to me, um, the fox was very important, but only five people read it. And that's not entirely true. It might have been true of Art Language Journal. But a couple of things there. Um, <laughs> behind a lot of the late work and behind what I'm trying to draw out of that history is this idea of collectivity um, and the site of learning and the situation of learning. Um, as general and as well accepted as it might be, uh, I think there is still a case to be made that one can look at it and you tell me how it's realized, if it's realized unproblematically or critically or in what way. That's very important to me. I mean, I've been involved in teaching now for 20, 25 years and I don't think anything about that can be taken for granted when, when one is in the situation. Secondly, um, a lot of conceptual art and, and the association with art and language flows from this very, this idea of a kind of a terroristic use of language where the texts were intentionally difficult um, also to kind of force the reader back on something, to kind of get the reader to reflect on the distinction between this kind of activity and intention and looking at art in galleries or museums. Um, a lot of what conceptual art seems to stand for is laid at the feet of Joseph Kossuth. And to make him into a poster boy and, and later a whipping boy for conceptual art is, is to do kind of a double injustice. Um, his work didn't define it didn't define it for me, it didn't define it for a lot of my colleagues and a lot of people that came after, but it did, as you say, rightly, um, posit the whole thing as a tautology, as a dead end, almost from the beginning. And then this idea of purity as conceptual art then is entirely um, a big target, falling into this trap um, that's set very well, I think, by Rosalind Krauss in Under Blue Cup. Um, so for me, the, the potential is, is, is not about lionizing what went before, but looking to see if there are relevant contemporary ways out that also engage with this idea of how we learn and what we do as artists. Um, that's, that's my interest in that, and I think there are still some interesting points that are raised. Opening the door is very important. I know that the, the artists that started to emerge in the 1980s, um, media practices, mass media practices, were looking specifically to solve the problem of how does one get an audience that is outside of the special small audience of art that was considered the norm and the rule in the 60s and the 70s, um, how to use art as a particular kind of media to communicate, and through that openness, you know, try to achieve something. Um, it's, an, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing problem, but I don't want to give the impression that um, just by talking about some of the aspects of conceptual art practices from that period that I'm either endorsing them or doing a historicist sweep for today. I think there's a lot of problematic stuff 
to look at there, but there are also a lot of very interesting and important points to kind of bring forward and develop. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just follow up on uh, something that was stated earlier and also maybe tie into what you were just describing. But um, first of all, I wanted to thank you uh, for, for the talk. I, I found it uh, stimulating and I also, um, I'm interested in the kinds of openings uh, that are suggested by uh, some of the, the directions that you pose. And I thought that the juxtapositions of different uh, of those uh, figures uh, that you um, presented w was an interesting one. Um, some of the notions also of elasticity, for example, uh, as well as an instability uh, in terms of uh, even the subject position, really, as an artist, is something that I think is uh, a topic that we continue to engage with. Um, your particular mention of Ian Byrne, I found to be very interesting because it raised a lot of uh, tensions uh, that I think are, are ongoing uh, in terms of trying to figure out, well, what would be uh, the relationship between those kinds of activities. And I think that this might relate to some extent to what Muntadas was referring to uh, and, and also what you mentioned uh, in relationship mm -hmm. to Alfredo uh, Jar uh, about like this kind of very small group and that this particular uh, linguistic investigation, if it were considered uh, primarily in that sense, was very uh, reductive. But what I thought was really interesting, one, I mean, there were various things I thought were interesting uh, in the presentation, but I was, I was interested in the way that uh, when you uh, pointed to the blurt, blurting aspect and the ways in which it relates to how different kinds of hypertextual uh, processes exist, um, that that was something that opens up a number of different kinds of possibilities for thinking um, in, in other kinds of ways, you know. And, and I, I mean, personally have been interested in how these different indexing processes have occurred and, um, you know. But I think, you know, what you mentioned about going back uh, and um, reviewing uh, or reconsidering different historical moments um, from another perspective uh, was, was particularly uh, inviting, I think. And I, and I mean, I remember when I was given a copy of Art and Language, uh, I think one of the publications when I was a student, mm -hmm. and I remember my art history professor then, th this was like 1980, 1981, was saying, well, I, I don't really know what to make of this, but if you want to try, go ahead. And <laughs> so, <For you. laughs> so, I mean, I think it's still pretty open-ended uh, in terms of the possibilities and where people get inspiration um, pretty broad. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to well, say thank that. Thank you for that. Yeah. <coughs> I'm curious to know more about um, uh, when you mentioned Donald Judd and his fabrication process and, and, and in, relation to, in relation to the scaling, could you speak a little, a little bit more about that? Um, sure. <laughs> um, well, I think the, the thing is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, Judd starts drawing plans and gives it to a metal fabricator to put together. Um, and this seems unusual to some people because um, the whole idea should be that he should make it and have the experience of making because in the experience of making, he'll learn how to make it better. So, um, but what Judd does is set up a situation which was not alien to uh, an artist like Laszlo Mahali Naj who, and, and uh, was the famous telephone piece, uh, but becomes part and parcel of an aesthetic of 
and way of working, a method of, of minimal art um, for, for quite a few artists. And this then is tied to what Ad Reinhardt said um, years earlier, uh, that painters should already have the idea of the work completely finished in their head. And the job is just then to execute it, which is how he tried to work, um, but had some unintended consequences. The surprise being how the individual paintings actually look when you stand in front of them for 15 or 20 minutes. The variety of that experience. Something that was completely, he could only get by looking and making and going back. So, so you have a sense of how deep is the preconception, how much preconception is enough. <clears throat> For Reinhardt, it was enough to say, I'm just going to do a 60 inch by 60 inch canvas with a tripartite division for the next six, seven years, whatever he anticipated he would just be doing those, those works. Judd, the, the determination was, here's the plan. So like an arc, I'm giving you a plan and you're then going to construct it. And that seemed to have drifted rather seamlessly lazily into the idea that conceptual art was an art of ideas, that one had the, con the concept and then somebody else fabricated it. And that's stuck with us today. When you call somebody like Damien Hirst a conceptualist, you're referring to that. So that's become standard operating procedure. It's every art student in the world knows this now. I'm a conceptual artist because I can give you a list, an inventory of, of the things behind this and then here's the object. The object's supposed to transparently instantiate these ideas unambiguously and all that. But of course, the wonderful thing about Judd is that, um, and in the example I showed you is one of the 100 untitled milled aluminum pieces that is in Marfa. And I, I think from what I've heard, people have seen that. It's an extraordinary experience because the works themselves start to dissolve because of the reflective properties of the metal and the light of the sight and the sheer number of them. So that's something that you couldn't get on the graph paper with the plan for the actual thing. And, and just to follow that, if then that knowledge, because the artist makes the work and looks at the work and considers it, reflects on it, critical reflection, that's actually, when we talk about PhD and practice led <laughs> subjects, um, what's a methodology? Oh, critical reflection. I'm going to sit in my studio, I'm going to look at this work or wherever it is, and I'm going to think about it. And then so, you know, you can't imagine that Donald Judd didn't understand those effects and then see what happened to try to recreate them. And of course, you know, again, I guess his collaboration with um, Dan Flavin and light, various light installations would sort of speak to that. A very simple plan can be shown, but the, the result is, is rather much more complex and richer. Okay. Yes. Hi, Michael. Hi. This is on? Um, okay, thank you. Um, I heard you speak years ago, and uh, I loved it then. Uh, then you were talking about Ad Reinhardt, mm -hmm. um, obviously. Um, so can you talk more about, um, well, tonight I'm interested in some things you said about Dewey. So can you talk more about the difference between uh, the artwork and the machine, specifically more on uh, the aesthetic, uh, on, on uh, what the aesthetic, the, the aesthetic work of art does? Um, and uh, for example, the functional language embedded in the abstraction of Reinhardt's modernist paintings, um, how that existed for him uh, in the way you've historicized them for having been intentional 
about the purpose of his painting practice, his uh, um, cartooning, his political cartoons, and uh, his facilitation, but how mm -hmm. that shows up in the, the, uh, the aesthetic abstraction. Yeah, well, that's very complex. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think the subject of a lot of new people in the field with looking at that in, in total, all of those practices. Um, I guess for me the point that Dewey was making was that a, a system, in other words, something that has a teleology doesn't necessarily result in standardization or repetition, um, depends how you understand that system. So the machine has no way of transcending itself. That's how he understood a machine. Of course, this is from early 20th century. We have machines now that we wouldn't call them, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, learning programs, and so on, just to get beyond that. So already that idea isn't going to hold, but what's happening is that our conception of a machine or a system is moving closer to the kind of stoke stochastic process of just everyday life or the serendipity of let's just play and see what happens. Of course, it's very hard to do that. Um, Reinhardt had lots of things going on, so in a way he was playing in a lots, of, lots of areas simultaneously, cartooning, illustration, um, writing, painting. Um, and projected the image that they were all very different and very separate. But in fact, the relationship was the same kind of experiential relationship that I discussed with, with Don Judd and seeing you know, the unexpected consequences of this and then how that might work to move another, another practice forward. And to enable that to happen, you have to be willing to break down the boundaries. You have to have permeable membranes between these various practices so that you have to constantly deconstruct your self-imagined self-description as, oh, I'm a cartoonist now. Today, in the morning, I'll illustrate. In the afternoon, I'll paint. In the evening, I'll philosophize and write criticism. And this kind of holistic potential is generally very poorly theorized or else shoved into the basket labeled Hegel and you know, given another bad um, kind of reputation. But it's, it's something that time and again comes up when people start to look at history and, and question the rational reconstructions of history. When Paul Fairband started looking at Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn, he said, wait a minute, I've got this idea and I'm gonna call it anarchistic epistemology and it's based on a notion that I'm gonna pick from Lenin's um, What Is To Be Done or left-wing communism and infantile disorder. I'm gonna talk about opportunism, the readiness to turn in any direction as the situation warrants. Um, that that is, is uh, I guess, the pragmatic definition of truth. I mean, if you think that aesthetics and beauty is a, is a rarefied quality and that they can only be talked about you know, in these sort of experiential ways, what about the concept of truth? I mean, have we kind of eliminated that? But philosophically, you've got the same kind of problem going on. You've got this idea of this, the universal versus the contingent. Uh, read Richard Rorty, you know, his, his um, revision of pragmatism and all. So I think there's something, something there. Um, I like Dewey because, I mean, Dewey was, was kind of contemporary with um, Meyer Shapiro, who was a teacher of Reinhardt, and um, a lot of what Reinhardt wrote about what the artist needs to do, you can read directly off of art and experience um, and so on. And, and it's kind of worth going back and, and, and trying to find, just trying to find some philosophical resources that are other than Badieu, Ranciere, Gambin, you know, the, the whole range. 
Simon Critchley, very, very interesting. Very interesting with his conjunction of aesthetics and, and ethics. Uh, no inside, no outside, okay, great. How do you get the alternative? You make it, and as you're making it, it comes into being. It's constituted through the practice. That's an that's a interesting orientation, and it's one that kind of conforms to, say, the uh, Derridian deconstructivist notion, there is no outside, there's no inside, you know, which, which seems like a trap to a lot of people. So the, the idea of a person like Reinhardt thinking about these things, inside, outside divisions, and then realizing, oh yeah, I'm making this collage for this cartoon, and this seems to be a way forward here, and I could try this, but I must erase my tracks have to disguise this because that's not part of the game of being an artist. I am rambling but open, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, should we have a couple more or we have time for one or two? Yeah. Um, My answers know. will be briefer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah. a quick one. Okay. I just, I just had a question uh, about like your personal kind of daily practice of uh, getting into a conversation and uh, with, you know, the issue of de-skilling. And I really like that you brought that up in your uh, presentation. I just was wondering how mm -hmm. you kind of attack it uh, yeah. daily. Well, um, one reads widely, uh, but also it's, it, I don't have the luxury of just considering it as a personal problem because as, as a chair, I have colleagues and we talk constantly about what's going on, and we're constantly fiddling with the curriculum, and the question is, you know, what should students be doing? Because, you know, I think one of the great challenges in, in dealing with art education is what, what is it gonna look like? Do you want to do something that mirrors what's going on in the contemporary world, or do you, do you have something else to offer, something possibly different? And so that's how the conversation proceeds. It's, um, it often always has a practical sort of conclusion attached, attached to it. But um, the luxury of just reading a, a far afield and um, working with other people in that way, um, you know, is how I do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Remotely and, you know, face-to-face, -face, because we can do that now. Yes. I just have a thought about play. How does play figure into this? Yeah, play play is important. I haven't I haven't delved as as deeply as as I could into that because that's a whole field, isn't it? And you know, part not just coming out of Piaget and the early works, but this this idea of free play and how it's um, conceptualized. Um, it's it's relevant. It is, um, however you want to describe the potential for open-endedness, for uh, non-goal-oriented -goal behavior. Um, it's, it's difficult, I mean, think about the, the situations where you can do that and think of what has resulted from that. How, how, um, how long it could be sustained, you know, before you say, it has to be directed, or even the play, you know. <laughs> Isn't there a paradox? You allow yourself to fr free play, and you come upon an insight or, or something, and it's immediately recontextualized as a solution or the beginning of something else. So it might be entirely impossible to consider play as an infinite extension, just nothing but, but um, there are enough kind of historical stereotypes or you know, characterizations of that, the figure of the jester. I mean, there are other kinds of play. The noise is off, you know, the, the kind of um, comments from backstage, as it were. So, <laughs> do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, play is important, and, and we, we ought to understand it more. Um, is it 
Um, yeah, I know. Confusion is the thing that, that most, most students I talk to are most afraid of. They fear it. They're so filled with anxiety about confusion. Um, and I, I guess we spend a lot of our lives with that anxiety. And maybe at the beginning and towards the end, we sort of relax a little, but that middle is a real bitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael.